This week on Backyard Footy. Knowing that somebody who's identifying players and selecting players is going to have a different mindset than anyone I've played for before is yes. huge. Yes. Because we're all all too often put in a box, you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, mm-hmm. they're I'm able to do that. this. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> commenting always on our athletic ability and never on our cognitive ability or technical skills and it's so frustrating it's so frustrating especially then when you know our non-black counterparts will get praised (laughs) will get praised on their athletic ability or something when it 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 doesn't even compare you know i'm like just (laughs) trust me it's crazy Easy. So yeah, it's sad. It's frustrating. It's difficult, but it's for sure one of the the main reasons that I do the work I do off the field too. What's up, footy fans? Your host Hugh Roberts, aka Superhuman. Feels good to be back again and get going. I was able to find a little studio out here in Monterey. Gonna have some nice live additions for you guys. Get some guys on my teams. Get get some uh, new stories getting go- getting going for you guys. But yeah, it's been a whole past couple of months for me. You know. Season just started. It's been a little slow start for us, so just trying to get the boys together and also having, you know, guests and other people kind of fake on me as well too. So you know, just just grinding and improving. You know, we keep it moving. But for episode fifty, I have a special guest, my first female guest. I have Jasmine Spencer here with me of Angel City. She's also one of the co-founders of the of the BWPC, and she has her own brand called Jazz It Up as well too. Definitely check that out. But it's an honor to have her. She's one of the pioneers of the Women's League. She was one of the first initial players in the league, 11-year pro, one of very good friends of mine. I'm happy to introduce. So without further ado, definitely subscribe and tune in on all platforms. Talk to you soon, footy fans. So what's up, Jazz? How's everything? How's the season going out in L.A.? Uh, It's good. I can't complain. The weather is beautiful. So definitely been excited about that um yeah we're in the middle of the challenge cup right now going through some growing pains as an expansion team for sure but um other than that it's good can't complain how's the expansion cup going um yeah it's good it's they split us up into regions so we're in the west coast with um san diego the other expansion team uh portland and seattle so i personally think it's the hardest group um but it, it's good it, it's it's fun to play games again and um yeah just a little trial before the regular season starts inaugural teams is a little tricky right i'm actually dealing with that for myself it's like my first time being on an inaugural team for the first year and it's a lot of growing pains like you said you know finding you have no core really before even coming into it you have to find your own identity so i know that's not easy i'm going through that right now <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and you get so competitive, you know, like you want to be able to come out and play your best every game. And exactly. then when the result doesn't go your way, you have to take a step back and be like, OK, yeah, like we're still figuring out our principles. Yeah, yeah. Um, everything's not going to be perfect. But but yeah, it's good. You know, our, our, our group is good and we're just excited to be a part of this club. It's it's pretty surreal. What's your role on the team this year, you would say? Oh, actually, it's funny. So I'm for sure one of the oldest veterans on the team. Mm -hmm. But I'm also probably one of the only people who's been on an expansion team before. So I feel like it's kind of like a little bit more of a responsibility because you're used to kind of taking a leadership role with like younger kids but also it's like you know people who have had the luxury of being at the same team for five six years and now having to be a part of a inaugural season like you said like they're like hey you know like what are some of the things that like you would focus on when you were in the first season at this expansion team and you know what are what are some non-negotiables so I feel like it's a little bit more of a, I guess, outward leadership role that I'm used to. I, I feel like I'm usually like lead by example, yeah. chill in the back <laughs> kind of person. Um, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm appreciating it. And it, it's cool. I'm laughing because me and you are kind of similar. I would say I lead by action myself. I'm actually the captain of the team this year. And we just got upset the last night in Open Cup. And me, typically, I'm, you know, I'm frustrated to myself. I want to pick myself up. Let's go. But 
I'm not really like a rah rah kind of guy to get the group on. But now, as a leader, like you have to get out of your comfort zone. You can't just be to yourself. So I'm like, man, like it's actually like I'm, I'm my ninth year as a pro, but I'm growing. Like it's brand new for me too. So I feel you 100. percent Exactly. Exactly. Do you have like um, difficulties on days where, like you said, like you're so used to kind of just taking care of yourself and making sure that you set a good example? But like, do you find it difficult to have to kind of be a little bit more um, social and like branch out to the rest of the team? I would say I wouldn't say it's like a difficult thing, but more so of me getting out of my comfort zone for sure. Uh, I would say, you know, typically on teams, you know, it's a couple of clicks here and there. You have your homies, you're cool with, you kind of stay within your group and that's that. But now I definitely found myself checking up on each and every guy, making sure everyone's healthy now, making sure everyone's there mentally too. And it's not necessarily like I was kind of talking about before me, you know, staying within my own bubble. I have to now get out of my comfort zone and, you know, branch out. So it's me definitely each and every day I'm growing more and more into that role. Definitely I'm not just, I didn't have it down packed, you know, as soon as the preseason started, but as these weeks have gone by, I'm getting more comfortable with the group. So yeah, definitely a little bit, but I'm growing with it. Yeah, nice. So briefly give us the timeline of how you got here. Ooh, it's a crazy story. Um, so my draft class, I my last playing year in college was 2011. And um, that was the last season that the old league, the WPS, was playing. So my draft class, we all got drafted into that league. Um, I think either end of December or like beginning of January 2012. Um, and then like three weeks later after the draft, you know, we're all like, hi, mm -hmm. like, yes, we're going to be professional soccer player. Right. Um, we get an email saying that the league had folded. Mm, that's right. And so, yeah, it was crazy. A lot of girls who had been in the league or had contacts hopped overseas really quick before the, the European transfer window closed. But a bunch of us kind of who were just starting or at the early stages of our career didn't really have uh, a plan B. Right. So for me, I had withdrew from my final semester of college because I was like, I'm all in, I'll finish school later. Mm -hmm. And then when the league folded, I went to re-enroll and I missed the deadline. So I couldn't even get back into school. Wow. Um, and then a bunch of the teams, uh, who were in the league, they basically came together and they were like, we'll need to provide something mm -hmm. for these women. So, um, they made like a, like a semi-pro league. It was just for the summer. It was like April to July mm -hmm. and we got paid per game, like $200 mm -hmm. per game. Right. And, um, we did that. And then I feel like from that experience, I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, if I have to go overseas to be a professional, I'll do it. Um, but I still kind of had this, like, like I want to finish school. I'm so close. Right. Uh, and a friend of mine who I used to play with actually did like a small three week um, study abroad program. And she was like, your scholarship will cover it. Like you should look into it. And so I looked into the study abroad programs that were offered. I went to the university of Maryland. So um, they, they were so good. And the only place I could go to finish my degree was Denmark. And I, I couldn't even like point it out on a map. I was like, I don't know where this country <laughs> is, but this is where we're going. Um, so I went, I lived in Copenhagen while I was there studying. I tried out for a bunch of different teams. I wound up um, landing on a, a team in the top division and I got to play champions league. It was, it was such an incredible experience. And then I was getting all ready to sign abroad too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. All while studying. Wow. Like I just took student athlete. To right. Right. Um, yeah. And I was getting ready to fin uh, finish signing a contract extension for the next year to just stay in Denmark. I like finished my degree. I was excited. And uh, they announced that the, the NWSL was going to be formed the next season. So I took my chances, came back home. Um, and yeah, 10, 10 years later, here, here I am. How did you balance school and you no know, champions league? That's, it's not just any kind of tournament. This is the top tournament in the world. <laughs> yeah. I, for one had amazing, um, professors with my program who, who love they love soccer. They were very supportive. So I was able to uh, miss class okay. and uh, just like make an arrangement to like, you know, get my notes, get the work. Um, but also I just think like being in 
being in Europe and like the, the appreciation for soccer there is different. So the lifestyle is different. Most of the girls on the team were either working a full-time job or, or in school, um, which is kind of the status of women's soccer around the world. Um, especially 10 years ago, you know, there weren't a ton of full professional leagues. Um, so it wasn't that different from, you know, the women on the team already, but I think what really was unique is that because it was kind of immersed in the culture already, the professors were like, Oh yeah. Like what you get to play champions league. Like I support that and I support you and, um, we'll, we'll work something out. So I think I was just very fortunate, um, to be able to do both. And especially early in my career where, you know, coming out of college, you're used to that, you know, maybe professors don't like it, but they understand that that is the agreement between you and the, the college. Um, so to have that experience kind of in the real world, um, it was just really fortunate to be honest. Yeah, I mean, to have people that understand the culture too, it goes a long way and it kind of give, gave you, you know, the love that you need to focus on your craft. I actually wanted to take things kind of a step back a little for a sec though. So I know you're born in Long Island out in New York and I know you were a dual athlete as well too. I wanted to talk about kind of like the footy culture in New York. How did you get involved with the game? Is that kind of what inspired you? And then talk about actually the benefits of, I also know you were a dual athlete as well too. Kind of, I also ask people who were do athletes, do you feel like that was a plus for you and helped you in this, uh, in your realm right now too, to get you where you are? Yeah, hundred percent. So I feel like my family, we love sports. So, and I'm the third child. I have two older brothers. So they played everything. Soccer was their favorite sport. My mom was a goalkeeper. So uh, I think we had an extra special love for soccer. Mm -hmm. Um, and everyone played soccer on, on Long Island, really. Like, you can bump into anybody and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I played rec when I was like five, six. It was the thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and my town in particular, the, there's Bayshore and right next to us is Brentwood. And um, it's pretty diverse. So I always tell people that I'm super fortunate because my first competitive soccer team was full of black and brown girls like Mm -hmm. our our trainer was from el salvador like i didn't know anything different than playing the game with people who looked like me Mm. um and it wasn't until i started to think about you know i want to play in college and i need to be in these elite teams and i need to be going to these showcases and when i transferred clubs and started competing, you know, at that high level of club that I realized like, whoa, like what happened to everybody who looked like me, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, like I know that I know that we love this game. I know that we're good at this game, but like, where is everybody? And that's probably the first, you know, when I started to get into high school, the first time that I realized that the game isn't really as inclusive or, or the access to the game isn't as inclusive as it should be and, and can be. Um, and I think I carried that, you know, I carried it through college. I went to University of Maryland, like I said, also a very diverse school. So anytime there was, you know, little black or brown girls at the game, I, I spent extra attention to them, you know, being like, this could be you, you want to play in college, you can do that. Because I remember, you know, when I was their age that I had a team like that. And why was it that I was one of the only few to make, to make it, you know? Um, and I think I carry that, you know, with my work with the today. BWPC and yeah, yeah everything yeah. that I'm doing today, for sure. And that's kind of exactly why I asked you about the culture from where you're from and your upbringing too, because that speaks volumes to, you know, why we do this. So, you know, the DMV is very diverse. I was actually blessed myself to have my one and only black coach in middle school, a Caribbean guy, who we had a very diverse Caribbean Spanish team that, you know, it was like a family to me and it kind of got me started to my first select team and everything too. But I feel like we're very fortunate to come from big cities like DC and New York that has that culture and people understand mm-hmm. soccer in general too. Cal- California here is actually kind of the same thing a little bit too. When I go to parks, I see kids playing soccer, but you really mm-hmm. don't see that often on a lot. And then as I climbed up myself as well, I saw less and you get to the academy system and into college, you see less of us playing this game and you start to wonder why. I wish I was like you early in my college career, kind of like a pioneer already talking to the black youth. I was definitely involved with the youth, but I was more kind of involved with my personal career. It wasn't until I turned pro to actually focus on like I was off the field. It was always my family first. 
or not necessarily getting involved into the community kind of things, but what you what you did from college on is inspiring the next generation too. And I think we all need to kind of do that and give back and then you can just spend some time with us too, because it speaks volumes and we need more of us to play this game. Yeah, hundred percent. Why UMD of all schools? Oh, actually, that's a funny story. I, Maryland wasn't even like on my radar. Like my dad loved the ACC. He loved Maryland growing up, like Maryland basketball. And so like was a fan, but it was, and it was like in my, I think original top 25, but it wasn't like when it was coming down to where I wanted to go. It wasn't, it wasn't on the top of my list. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to UNC Wilmington because, you know, I grew up on the island. I lived at the beach all the time. They had this incredible marine biology program. I was like, that's my school. And I went to visit Maryland and them in the same week. And um, Maryland had, you know, all the big school facilities and everything. And I was like, this is cool. And then I got down to Wilmington and I was like a mile from the beach. And I was like, nope, I'm home. Yeah, This is it. Um, and close to the end of my recruiting process, uh, the coach from Wilmington wrote me and said, listen, we just signed a, a local North Carolina girl. Um, and we're not going to have the scholarship money that you deserve. So we want to let you give you the chance to explore other opportunities. And I'm so, so, so grateful for him doing that and not, you know, just trying to get me for cheap or anything and really caring about my well-being. Yeah. Um, because ultimately, I, I just couldn't afford to go to Wilmington without the scholarship and Marilyn offered it to me. And so I was like, reluctantly like I guess I'll go to Maryland <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. but it, it, it wound up being the best thing for me yeah, and, yeah, you yeah. know everything works yeah. out how it's supposed to for a reason right yep do you have a why to why you're doing this my why is just I mean I guess it's multi-dimensional like my family I feel like I'm so fortunate from the being born and raised in the family that I come from being so close knit and having them support me. And I know that that's not the case amongst our community. And I just want to extend that love and respect to people like us um, and just let them know that they can do anything they want. And also it just makes me happy. Like being that for somebody else brings me joy. So it sounds kind of crazy, but like I'm partially doing it to help us, but also because it makes me feel good. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. Why well, do these things as well, too? You know, it, it's impactful seeing kids smile and, you know, get motivated and actually just like listen to you. And you know that they're soaking everything up like a sponge because that's how we were, too, you know? Yep, exactly. So you go to the combine, get drafted. Did you have a welcome to the NWSL moment, like a wow moment? Uh, I feel like my whole rookie season was a wow moment. We were like, (laughs) we had like maybe six veterans and they were kind of toward the end of their career. So, you know, they were knowledgeable and they were great, but there was no kind of core group of veterans. It was like the six of them and then like 18, either rookie or, Mm -hmm. you know, only played overseas and we were terrible. I think we won like five games, maybe out of the whole season. Um, So, so that whole season was a learning curve. And I, I think that the next layer to that is I, I went to Cyprus in the off season uh, for a small, a small team, but they were also in champions league. So it was a good, you know, I, I knew I was going to get a good uh, training environment and competitive game environment. Um, and back then our season was literally four and a half months. So, so I needed to continue yeah. to play. Yeah. Um, so I was doing great, you know, scored a couple goals in Champions League. I was like, I'm coming year two, I'm coming. (laughs) And and my coach, uh, he seemed really supportive. And then I got home from Cyprus right around Christmas time. And like a week later, he was like, oh, I'm sorry, we have to waive you. Mm. And I'm like, what? Like, you've been following all this, you know, accomplishments I've had in the off season. I'm ready. I, you know, had a good end of the season with you you know and that's when I realized that this is a business you know this this is the real deal and you know there were only 18 players on a roster then and and eight teams so not only is it a business but it's like there's no room for Uh anybody unless you're willing to fight and compete and Mm -hmm. 
and show that you deserve to earn a contract. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's like the, probably the first time I was like, okay, do you really, really want to do this? Cause we're not making any money you know, on top of that. So you have to be willing to have no stability in your life to chase Mm -hmm. this dream. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wanted it, I wanted it bad. So I got invited to a preseason with Western New York flash. They're now the North Carolina courage. Um, but yeah, I, I went on trial with them in preseason and made that roster. And I feel like my mindset had changed. My first year, I was like, I'm a professional. Like, I, I got a contract. This is a dream. I'm getting paid to play. And then year two on, it was like, no, I need to prove to people that I'm the real deal to yeah. keep my contract and to be in consideration to make not only make a roster, but then be in a starting 11 consistently. Perfect segue, because I wanted to dive into your career, a very illustrious career. I mean, back and forth a lot from NWSL to the W League in Australia to Europe too. And you touched on the mental aspect of it all. How was it like mentally for you almost every year, you know, kind of going back and forth and dealing with the transition from a European style to the American style? Yeah, it was hard. It was hard because I feel like I was growing certain aspects of my game, but also sacrificing others. And it just depended on the league I was in. Right. Um, when I was in Europe, it's such a it's such a tactical game mm. that, you know, and growing up through in the US system, like it's very like athleticism yep. based. Yep. You, you need yep. a technical foundation, but if you have a level of athleticism, like you can sp- squeak yes. by, yes. you know, and, and that doesn't matter in Europe. So mm-hmm. um, adding that to my game, especially early on in my career, I feel like is what started to set me apart when I would come back in Very true. to the NWSL. Um, and then, you know, it started to mold me into a more complete player. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I was better for it, for sure. But it was also like the only thing you really could do because our season was so short. You know, a lot of people would play in the NWSL and then like coach at a college in the office or get a real job and have to like train on their own. And that's, that was just a lot, you know, especially for somebody early in their career where you're not really established. I felt like you couldn't take those months off. You had to continue to, to build your resume. And so for me, it was just about getting better and finding um, ways to play year round. So you would say kind of branching out, getting out of your comfort zone, trying new new experiences almost like leveled you up and added more, you know, weapons to your arsenal kind of thing. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And it just like, I started to feel like, oh, I can be considered not only one of the best in the league, but the the world. Cause now, you know, I'm playing in champions league where I'm running into the Barcelona's and you know of the world and maybe my team isn't great but I'm getting that experience of playing against those players and then coming back into the NWSL and you know being able to be more confident because I'm not only seeing the best American players but the best internationals and the same with Australia Mm. um you know the Australian women's team they're top five in the world they're great and and playing against them in the off season um, you know, it just, it made me more confident in, in my abilities and just like be able to grow as a player at the same time. And cause I, I, I'm, I wasn't on your aspect as well, but I've been, this is my fifth team now in my nine years as well. And a lot of it, I didn't want to go, but a business, like we said, we had to learn. And I've actually thought of it, you know, just thinking back, it's actually been a blessing that I've bounced around to different markets and different coaches and different systems. Cause it's actually elevated my game as well. Cause you learn and take bits and pieces and kind of elevate yourself too. And I advise, especially young players, you're comfortable in your academy and your market, but it's time sometimes to just get out there and branch out and grow. And I'm glad you touched on that as well too, because it's great for people to hear the growth sometimes that you get when you leave your comfort zone and just try different things. Cause it's important to, even if it kind of goes bad, it still brings you know, your mental toughness up and it gets you stronger to where you need to be next kind of thing too. So I appreciate you touching on that. 100%. So in 2019, you tore your ACL after not having too many injuries and took almost two to three years off. I know COVID played a little role in that as well too. So I want to talk about definitely how did you persevere from that? And also what was the bubble situation like for you guys and how did you guys deal with that during that time for yourself? 
Yeah, honestly, it feels like a time loop. And I know I'm not the only <laughs> one who who lost it, but like tearing my knee the year before COVID, it's like I skipped like three years. Mm -hmm. um, but when I tore my ACL, I, I knew it immediately. Mm. I was like, it felt like when you sprain your ankle, but in your knee. And I was like, I just laid there and was like, damn. Yeah, I definitely just tore my ACL. Yeah. Um, and I thought I was like immune to that. I was like, <laughs> even the doctor, my one of the surgeons that I met with, he was like, you are not the typical <laughs> physique yeah. of someone who tears their ACL, but like things happen. Yeah. Um, and I think I just really made a decision. I was like, this sucks, but I'm not going to let this define me. Like, I'll be back. Mm. And I know it sounds crazy because it's a long injury and it, it's taxing. Like I cried, screamed, like I had bad days for sure, but of course. I just chose to be happy through yeah. that all and to yeah. just take it in stride. And um, I think, again, I just like credit my family for being such an incredible support system through it all. And my now husband, like he, he's been on this journey with me since year one of my career. So um, yeah, like he, he, he was there every step of the way, helping me bend my knee, you know, gotcha. being my punching bag when I need, but also lifting me up when I need and just, you know, believing in me and my ability to come back. And so coming back, I would say, I think it took like 10 and a half months, mm -hmm. um, you know, feeling good, getting ready. And then, yeah, having COVID shut down the league, I was like, oh my God, like, am I gonna ever play soccer right. again, you know? Right. Um, but I think I, I just wanted to play again so bad that it, I didn't care how long it took. Gotcha. Um, and then, yeah, we, we found out we were gonna do the Challenge Cup and, and live in a bubble and it was crazy. Like <laughs> we, were, we, we were in a bubble for two months because we were, I was in Seattle at the time and that's where the cases kind of started. Gotcha. Um, and so you couldn't do anything in the state of Washington where other uh -huh. teams kind of would have, you yeah. know, restrictions, but like they could train. We could not train as a team in that state. So we, we went to Montana for a month and we were in a bubble in Montana. And like oh. living, literally living, wow. they packed up like four moving like big box trucks we all put our stuff in there for like what we needed to live for two months right. wow. our staff drove it from seattle to montana we flew um and then we were in montana for a month and then they drove from montana to utah salt lake was hosting our our bubble mm -hmm. so then the staff drove our stuff to salt lake and then we were in a bubble in salt lake so for two months all we saw was ourselves, really. It was crazy. Uh, and it was tough, you know, like it It was really, really intense. The games are intense to begin with, let alone, you know, right. being secluded. Right. Um, and then we, you came out of it. And I remember we went back to Seattle like two months later and it was like, like a back to the future moment. <laughs> like people were walking around. And yeah, we were like, yeah. This is crazy. Um, Would you I'm say grateful. mentally that was a tougher year than like your average full season year outside? Yeah, a hundred percent. Because there was no time. There was no time to, you know, preseason was four weeks and then the tournament was four and a half weeks. Right. And that was it. And we didn't know if we were going to have a season after that. Mm -hmm. So it was like, this is your four and a half weeks out of the whole year mm -hmm. where you get to compete. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine it would be like any major tournament. Like if you're playing in a world cup or an Olympics or, or Euros, you know, it's, it's at such a tiny bit of time frame that you're competing, but you've prepared mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. for it. That's what it felt like, especially coming off of my knee. Um, so yeah, it was super intense. What, so would you say mental toughness is more important than physical? Yeah, a hundred percent. Because I feel like, as an athlete, you expect to have some physical pain, whether it's, you know, fit, you know, training your fitness level or getting stronger in the gym or picking up an injury. Like, you know, that that's a part of the game and you can kind of prepare for that, but having the mental toughness to deal with the things that you don't 
know right. are coming right. at you right. Right. is is <laughs> what separates, I think, yes. people from becoming a pro, the type of career you have as a pro, yeah. and your and your longevity because yeah. it's it's a tough career. Yes, it's not all glitz and glam, and you you have to have the head for it for sure. Yeah. That's exactly why I ask you, because I'd say the same exact thing, literally, even the, the aspect of re-signing new contracts every single year, like that is very tough. Signing your first contract is tough, but renewing every year for different clubs and different markets, I mean, you're, especially you going overseas, is very tough to do. And, you know, not even just that, but every day, that means you have to keep your fitness sharp, your touch is sharp. That's a lot. There's a lot of pressure every single day. And we, I know you've seen it. I've seen it in my career. Our friends and just peers around us, probably even more talented than us, just quitting and giving up. Or even, you know, you actually touched on another good point. If you don't have the mental strength, your career actually doesn't go in the way that you want it to go either. You know, a lot of those things play a role, too. And it's kind of something that it doesn't happen naturally. You just build it up over experience. And it's and like you said, up to you. And I commend you for having that positive mindset because I doubt you'd even be here today if you weren't, you know, pushing yourself and motivating to get back to where you were before. Yeah, for sure. So being a black woman in the sport, uh, I know you're one of the co-founders of the BWPC. You've been doing this movement for a while. But before I touch into that, I wanted to ask you growing up, you did mention you were on a very um, diverse team. But when you got to college and the pro realm and everything, what are some disparities you face? Have you, and also have you seen too many black coaches as well as you've gone throughout your career? I have had three. One is my one is my dad. So two, <laughs> <laughs> two black coaches. Um, my assistant coach in college was black, and my assistant coach when I played in Orlando was black. And actually, we just we just signed uh, a, another. We added another member to our coaching staff here in LA, um, who's black. But apart from that, of all the years of all the coaches, that's it. Mm -hmm. Count on one hand, um, and it's it's difficult because I feel like your relationship with, with your coach is also multi dimensional. You know, like this is somebody who's your leader. You look to learn to, but that's also cool. like at this stage, they're invested in your life too. And yeah. so when they don't fully understand what you're, what you're going through at times, it's hard. It's hard to gain that level of trust mm -hmm. um, and respect. Mm -hmm. um, and you always want to be respectful, of course, but you know, it's hard when, when you can't really relate to them. Um, right. Right. And it's, you know, it's something that I know we, both of us are working towards advocating for more diversity but not only in the coaching staff but like front office staff. like mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I've never seen a black GM yeah ever ever mm -hmm. um yeah or just like we have our director of sport who does all of our recruiting she's she's a black woman she um I think she has like over 100 caps for England incredible but like having her there you know and just like knowing that somebody who's identifying players and selecting players is going to have a different mindset than anyone I've played for before is yes. huge yes. because we're all, all too often put in a box, you know, mm -hmm. like, Oh, I'm they're able to do that. this. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> Commenting always on our athletic ability yes. and never on our cognitive ability or technical yes. skills. And it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating, especially then when, you know, our non-black counterparts will get praised. <laughs> we'll get praised on their athletic ability or something when it oh, it, it doesn't even compare, you know? Trust I'm like me. just <laughs> trust me. It's crazy. So yeah, it's sad, it's frustrating, it's difficult, but it's for sure one of the the main reasons that I do the work I do off the field too. And, and it's exactly why I ask why, because people always ask, why is this even important, right? Little things like literally I've been on a away trip where a white coach is just talking to random reserve white players, which is great, but they, you know, your natural human tendencies, you're comfortable with your own kin and who you're used to. So 
I couldn't even knock them sometimes when I see them putting their arms over so-and-so instead of me and not having that conversation, right? You see those a lot of little nuances or you're on the field as you mentioned about positions and you're really only restricted to, I was a striker actually my whole life and was recruited as a striker at George Mason. And then as we say, if you're fast and black, you get moved to the back. And I got moved to the back and we're usually just a center back, outside backs, wingers or strikers. And it's literally every time, but we have the abilities and the cognitive, especially abilities to, you know, handle the middle of the park. So that's why I touch on these things with the recruiting process, the front offices who we're hiring, the coaching staff, all these things matter because, you know, we want to ultimately create a safe, included environment, but it can't be inclusive if there's people that aren't, aren't like-minded like us too. So I'm glad you touched on all that as well, exactly why I asked. Yeah, hundred percent. And I don't know if you experienced this too, but I feel like, um, I feel like a lot of young black players get pigeonholed because of their athletic ability. Then, then coaches don't feel the need to continue to coach the other areas of the game. Cause they're like, Oh, they're already better. Like, no, you're hindering that player's potential by not even continuing to focus on the other area of the game. So it's like, that's so true. and if you do damn, if you don't kind of, <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's right, tough. man. That's a good point. So during the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, I personally remember seeing, I guess, a little controversy in the NWSO, some women kneeling, some women not kneeling. How was the, what were the combos like during that time? I know it was a tough situation for everybody across the world, honestly. How did you guys manage that, that situation? Yeah, I, um, I was really fortunate. I was at Seattle at the time and Seattle club from you know year one has been so diverse so inclusive um and so open-minded and really built a team around people who are open-minded so we kind of went back to the beginning we had a book club we talked about why racism exists why it's still prevalent um what what the black experience looks like today why kneeling is important um and there were some painful conversations in there but i think because the organization and the team was so loving and caring. It was a safe space mm. and uh, having that space to um, have those difficult conversations and then grow from them um, was huge. And so we were one of the few clubs where everyone was kneeling, mm. which was amazing. But the disparity between the teams was one of the biggest reasons we started the BWPC, you know, because we were fortunate here at Seattle. And then there were some other clubs where you had players not even coming out. Yeah. of the tunnel yeah. and you know one or two black girls having to come out to want to you know stage their protests and and you know show solidarity for a movement on their own and not even feeling support from their team right and so one of the main reasons we started the bwpc was just to create a safe space for ourselves for all the black girls across the league to know that you know we are here for each other um no matter what team you play on, like we get it, we we wanted to create just a resource for ourselves right. and then take that and extend it into our communities as well. Right, right, right. How, what, what's the BWPC's mission? I wouldn't say just today, but throughout this, the course of the years, what's been the main framework for you guys? Yeah, we wanna empower all women of color specifically young black girls, but not just in the sport of soccer. We want them to know that whatever facet of life, that there's a path to success. And we wanna to start to build those relationships. So, you know, beyond their engagement in soccer, they feel like they can, they can get to that next level through us. So we've got some really cool initiatives coming up this year that um, aren't just soccer related. I think, you know, working with you all and the BPC on the mini pitches has been huge. That was huge for us last year. And we're definitely going to continue with that. Um, but we're also going to touch on areas um, like mental health, wellness and hygiene, um, other area like leadership um, and just partnering with other different organizations to, to bring some really cool initiatives to life. So Love yeah, that. it's going to be great. It's needed. It's needed. I'm glad you guys are doing this on, on your side as well, too. But lastly, before we touch on your brand, I have to ask personally because it's very different in the men's game, but what's the difference, some differences between a male's coach 
in a female's coach. We kind of, you tend to see that kind of often in the women's sport, but don't see that at all in the men's world. But what's kind of the differences between both genders, you know? Yeah, I feel like that's, uh, I guess, opportunity. You know, it's just like, 10 times harder for a woman to prove that they are qualified to get that job, um, which in and of itself is an issue. Um, but also on the flip side, there are a lot of men who come in and they think because they've coached boys or men before that they have an understanding of the women's game and how to, how to coach women. And it's two completely different things. You know, the game's different. Um, player management is different. And without that, experience um coaches fail and and sometimes clubs think it's that coach and they're not understanding that no it's not it's not that the it's not like you need to find another man and it was that coach like sometimes you need to go out and find a different caliber of coach yeah. one that can relate to your players that understands the women's game understands player management um and that there are qualified women out here that can, right. can that can do the job. Right, exactly, exactly. Exactly why I asked too, because we tend to see a lot of male actually dominating kind of the women's industry. And I'm just like, there's a lot of talented women. You guys are all playing, going into the coaching realm. So why can't you circle back into the same thing? It's a wicked system, a male dominated system. Mm -hmm. So you see it. And this is exactly why I asked. So talk to us about your brand, Jazz It Up. How did it get started? What's your mission and everything and your vision for it? Yeah, jazz it up. It's about f five years old now. That's crazy. Wow. Um, I started it when I was in Orlando and really it's just an extension of myself and just, you know, encouraging people to live with intention and um, discipline. And there's a definitely an aspect that I that I tie into sustainability growing up on Long Island and living at the beach. Yeah, I just yeah. have such a love for um, the environment. And so I kind of built it around this idea that we need to protect our planet and we need to protect the people that we share it with. And uh, not a lot of people are aware of how, you know, our day-to-day -day habits affect right, others right. and affect the planet. And so it's kind of just like a, a educational sp space really. And mm -hmm. I, I share my message through clothing. Um, so, so yeah, it's pretty cool. I like Anything it. exciting coming up this year with, the, with you guys? um i've got a couple things in the works hopefully they'll um be ready later in the summer right now um i'm still uh running this collection that i partnered with the organization called sbp they provide um disaster relief to families affected by natural disasters mm -hmm. so the collection is called gone by 2050 and it basically focuses on all the major cities that could potentially be underwater or basically inhabitable because of the effects of climate change starting as early as 2050. Um, and, you know, I've said it like three times, but literally growing up on Long Island and being victim to Hurricane Sandy and all these crazy superstorms, you know, my dad worked for the power company and was on mandatory 16 hour shifts when, when that storm came through and seeing people's homes get washed away and, um, you know, experiencing that and knowing that people are still going through that year after year, I just wanted to shed some light on it and find a way to provide some resources to people who are, are still dealing with that. So um, that's my latest collection. Yeah, love and that. Yeah, thank you. Where, Got some new stuff later in the year. Where can they find you? We'll find the brand and where can they find you? Um, so we are on Instagram jazz it up j-a-s it up underscore official also my website jazz it up official.com and then you can find me on instagram at j spence three j-a-y spence three i'll tag her and make sure you guys follow her definitely check out her brand too she's doing great stuff but follow the everything her work her career the mission from the women's group and everything jazz this is a great episode i really appreciate you again for hopping on thank you for having me Stay tuned, you guys. Talk to you guys soon.